This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Good evening. I'm your host, Alice Stockton Rossini. How you doing? How you doing over there, Rob Barrett's my engineer and faithful friend. And you are the faithful Page Publishing Book Club fan. Looking for some answers? Looking for some guidance, some inspiration, some ideas for that first book you're this close to writing. This close, Rob. Am I right? Or are you just here for the entertainment? Because I got to tell you, some of these authors are pretty entertaining. Tonight, we begin with success because that's what we all want to be, right? Happy, successful, rich would be nice. But bottom line, everybody wants to be successful. And our first author is a professor of education. She has a master's in counseling and a PhD in educational psychology. Pretty successful, I'd say. Nanthalia McJamerson wrote Reconstructing Lives, Taking the Mystery Out of Success. And she says, this is the recipe. This is it for success. And it's based on years of research and practice. Now, this was the end result of a project for your PhD in educational psychology. I created the project many years ago as a new creative way to help people look at what went into success. And so often, you know, we heard people talking about the secrets of success and so many people assume that you need something special, you need money, you need connections. And so as a part of teaching educational psychology and human growth and development, I learned as the teacher that everybody can become successful if we know what it takes and how to get there. And I have a little twist to it to, to make it interesting to students. So that, that was the beginning of it. So what is the secret to success? <laughs> is it simple? Well, you know what? It's, that's a good question. It's complex but easy. And I know that doesn't make sense. But it takes several things. It takes a combination of things, but they are available to anybody. That's what I mean by easy. Sometimes people say, well, what's the sole reason? What's the key? But I found in studying great people and studying uh, human development, it's not one thing. It's a combination. But it's a combination that's available to everybody. Is that combination different for everyone? Well, the, the categories are the same, but they may manifest or show up in different ways. So, for example, ability nutrition, you need somebody in your life who notices that you have particular abilities, which we all have some. And if you can get people who see that and nurture that, then the next thing I call um, ambition ignition. Something has to happen in your life to really ignite your interest, to turn you on, to help you say, wow, that's what I would really like to do or get into, even, you know, even children. And then the third one is cardiac reserve. <laughs> you need somebody who can make you feel special or loved or valuable in your life. Now, most of us know that, but oftentimes some people, some children are treated as though they are not valuable. And so there needs to be somebody or something that makes a person feel valuable, loved, cared for, cared about for themselves, for being who they are. The fourth one is what I call apex nerves. That is, you need somebody in your life who will push you who has the courage to push you to do well, to, to be excellent, who will not accept inferior, uh, low-level achievement, but they see you can do better and they push you. Uh, so often you have people who don't want to upset you, they don't want to hurt your feelings, or they don't want you mad at them, but you need somebody who, who has the guts to say, look, you can do better, and here's how. The uh, fifth one, is what I call insight trams. I have found with working with students and adults as well that sometimes we just don't have insight into different things. Even children who do well, um, who know how to study, who know how to memorize, they still don't have insight about how things really work and operate. And, and then the final category is what I call opportunity rams. There are times you need somebody to help you 
open doors to show you how to get to opportunities. You can have everything, but if you never get an opportunity to to use it and develop it, you still don't get where you could. It, it, this is what we have found in terms of really you know, becoming great or high achievement. That's what we're after here. But how are you telling people about your book? Well, for one thing, I do go to some conferences and um, – <laughs> I do a little bit of guerrilla marketing. I put together brochures and to distribute doing presentations, and I have had a chance to do a few book signings, and that's another way I plan to promote it in the future. Nobody can advocate for your book better than you can. That's what you got to do. I used to be shy about doing that, but then I did discover, and actually my late husband helped me realize exactly what you said. You have got to try to advocate for yourself. You know, no matter how good your product is, if nobody knows about it, it will not make a difference. So I have had to learn that, Alice, that I have to help promote myself. Well, you know what? That's <laughs> that's something we all have to learn, Nathalia. You're not alone. Did you know that there's an army in heaven? Yes, it's the name of Kelly Jankowski's book. She's a hospice nurse, and she says she has proof of it. Kelly. Yeah, well, I was critical care for 27 years, so we would bring people back because I did cardiac ICU. So we would bring people back, and they would tell me stories that they experienced on the other side. And then after doing that for so many years, I just couldn't do it anymore because it was so stressful when everybody's saying, do everything for grandma, and she's 95 years old. And shoving tubes in people at 95 years old when you know their death is coming anyway, was it was just too much. So, so people really do cross over to the other side and remember an experience. Oh, yeah. The most common theme that I had heard was not only going through a tunnel, most of them go through a tunnel, but the underlying theme was peace. So much so and so much love that from then on, they are no longer frightened of death in any way, shape, or form. In fact, they welcome it. They can't wait for it. And I find that fascinating because I think we all have a natural fear of death. But the people that have gone through this, when they return, that is completely taken away. I just wonder how much of it is our mind, our brain. I mean, a lot of people a lot of people think that, but sometimes people know what's going on when we think they're dead. They will see loved ones crying or they'll be, you know, see loved ones in California and when they wake up, they tell them what they were doing. I don't think the mind can just make that up. You know, the mind can play tricks on us. Yes, that's true. But to completely get rid of any sort of fear of death, I don't know. I think these experiences are, are real to the point that people's lives will completely change. One man that I, that I took care of who did not have a good experience completely changed. He was what he called a just a self-centered, egotistical, all about me, me, me. And when he had his experience, when he came back, he was completely different. His wife told me, he said, this is not the same man 20 years ago. So like a Scrooge kind of an experience. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Or they see, or they see loved ones on the other side, which is also very interesting. Were you compelled to write this? Absolutely. Especially when I started in hospice, because when people would, would come back and tell the experiences that they had on the other side and how much there, and how there was no pain, and they saw people that they hadn't seen in many, many years, and just the experience that they, they had on the other side, when I would tell my hospice patients who, who were scared to die, or the family members who wanted to know why mom was lingering for the last 10 days, and I would tell them you know, different things that people would see, it brought them so much peace and comfort. I had been telling these different accounts to so many people when they were struggling with life and death kind of situations that I thought, well, maybe now it's time I put it down in book form so that I can bring comfort to more people. And my kids were all, and my husband too, were like, you need to write these things down because these are unbelievable. <laughs> what, what do you mean by the army? Who's the army in heaven? I had this one little lady who um, was paralyzed from the waist down, and she was very, very dear. So I left in the morning, and I said goodbye to her. And she said, is there anything that I can do for you? You've been so nice to me. And I thought it was just so, so sweet because she couldn't do anything for herself. And so I said, yes, there is. I said, I said when you get to the other side and you meet God face to face, 
will you please pray for me? And she got a big smile on her face, and she put up she put up her arms, she gave me a hug, and she said, I absolutely will. So I told my brother about it, and he says, do you always ask that of your patients? I said, yeah, often I do. And he says, well, undoubtedly. He said, if they have all remembered your request, you no doubt have an army in heaven praying for you. And I just thought that was so awesome. I thought that's a perfect name for a book. It's a great name for a book. Thanks, Kelly. Timothy Belcher is the kind of guy who just wants to live his life, no interference, no judgments, and he expresses his frustration with trying to do just that. In his book entitled Hell on Earth, Timothy, let's start with your main character. What's his name? The name of the main character would be D'Artagnan. He has a underground mansion down in the southern lands. He's a bounty hunter, and he's also as a member of council. And there are a group of people that fight for their way of life and fight for what's right. In other words, not willing to stand by and let other people take everything over. And they don't like the idea of other people oppressing upon them a way to live and trying to take everything over. They want to live free and happy. They don't want the government coming in and telling them what to do and how to live. and Exactly. Well, we went from a war of the government to a war against religious oppression. A bunch of religious fanatics? I guess you could call them a bunch of religious fanatics, yeah. You know, they want to try to oppress religion upon everybody and their religion only because they think that what they believe is right and nothing else. And in our opinion and members of the council don't see it that way, and they're not going to stand by and allow that. Okay, so these, these two groups end up fighting each other throughout the book. Right. What is it that you want us to learn from this? Well, you know, I actually did put some uh, real-life moments into it, you know, to make it more real. So it's not all completely war after war after war, so to speak. Say the more of the story would be to fight for what you believe in. And and that's kind of how you feel in real life, right? Exactly. So this kind of is your experience, right? Metaphysically, yeah. But, you know, D'Artagnan... I actually based him upon me, about, you know, how I feel about things and how I react. I've never really experienced war or combat or anything like that, but I have experienced people trying to tell me how to live, trying to tell me what to do. For example, the publication of this book, I went through a lot of haters and naysayers and people telling me that I should put it on hold. Uh, Some people telling me that I shouldn't even be writing it all. But obviously I didn't listen to any of them. No, you didn't listen to any of them, and you went ahead and you wrote your book, and I think you should be proud of yourself for that. Oh, believe me, I am. Despite everything I went through, I came through with a four punch, so to speak, and I went through it. Now, I, I just, I'm just worried about one thing. Did, did you really lose your house because of this book? Yes, I did, but it was my choice. Right now, I'm living on a fixed income, and it doesn't go very far. And I had to make monthly payments to get the book published. I mean, it was definitely a rough choice to make. I will not teach. It's definitely a decision I tossed and turned over about whether they either, you know, keep the home and wondering what would happen or take the leap of faith, so to speak, you know, give up my home and go ahead and get the book published, you know, just to sit and to see if it would sell or not. I'm now, I'm no longer homeless. You know, I've got me another place. So I'm no longer homeless, thankfully. (laughs) All right. But I was homeless for about 10 months. But one thing that actually gave me inspiration to keep going with it, I remember somebody told me about the author J.K. Rowling. When she first first started out, she was homeless. And look where she is today. So, I mean, it's one of those things, hey, you never know until you try. (laughs) Timothy, I got to tell you, you are persistent, if nothing else. And, and I do. I hope everything works out for you. And I hope you're not going anywhere because we got some great stories coming up, including a really inspiring one about one man's battle with bipolar disorder, a spooky iron doll, and making order out of chaos. Grab a snack. Come on back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800 204 6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them, and they'll even give you their feedback. 
And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes Store, and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity, and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry, or biography, and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. And we're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. Thanks for joining us. Michael Jackson suffered with bipolar disorder for most of his life, but not anymore. And if you know anyone with bipolar disorder, Michael's story could really be a big help. Michael, you say you resisted treatment for years. Why? That's one of the classic traits of uh, folks sometimes that have mental illness. They don't want to come to grips with it. Uh, I didn't truly believe it. Uh, Basically, uh, my bipolar disorder, I suffered more so on the manic side, which gave me uh, lots of energy. Uh, I was a hard worker in the different professions that I held. And uh, I really didn't believe that I had it. Uh, The turning point for me was I had a lovely wife who has been by my side for 39 years who um, had enough. I wouldn't seek treatment on conventional uh, methods. So what she did is exercise a restraining order. Uh, I violated the restraining order. Uh, She made sure that I uh, got locked up for that. And uh, when I was in there, I finally came to grips when I opened my eyes and uh, I was sober, away from alcohol and street drugs, which I used self-medication. And then when I opened my eyes and I was also receiving uh, treatment for my bipolar disorder while I was uh, incarcerated for 90 days. And then I finally came to grips to own up that I was bipolar. And I accepted it. I accepted the treatment. And once I was released, uh, I went to the veterans hospital, uh, continued the treatment. And at that point, uh, I never used street drugs and alcohol again. And I became consistent on my medication which has been over seven years. And uh, while I was in there also, I seen the devastation in the young men that were incarcerated. And uh, while I was in there is when I formed uh, a nonprofit organization that I run now, and I am the president of. It is called Think, Then, Choose Wisely. Because after I sat there and talked with those young men and looked in their eyes, I found most of them were in there because they did not think about what they did before they did it. And now they're sitting there facing 20 and 30 years, and it really hit my heart. And I said when I got out of there that I was going to use my time going around speaking to young men and women about their impulsive behavior and the consequences of their choices that could cause them to lose their family, their freedom, and maybe their life. The devastation that we're seeing young people today. And now you have this book to take with you. Uh, Yes, ma'am. I go out on my speaking engagements. I uh, tell my story, the good and the bad, address the mental uh, issues of uh, folks that we see Uh, going through today, and uh, for once in my life, uh, I am not ashamed to say that I am bipolar, but I also point out to them uh, how they can live a functional life with the proper treatment, because being untreated is one of the most dangerous things uh, for a person. Great story, Michael. Talk about turning your life around. Think then choose wisely. That's the name of his nonprofit. If you want more information, just Google it. On the line, we have Patty Sefstrom and Don Weingarner. Don wrote a book entitled The Iron Doll and says 
Couldn't have done it without Patty. So what's the story with this iron doll, Patty? It's basically about a casino being built out in Dodge. The process had to be shut down because uh, people were being found dead out on the property, out on the construction site. And um, and they, they know how they're dying. You know, it has to do with tattoos being found on these, you know, the dead bodies. And they're trying to connect the what the tattoos and what the, you know, what that has to do with the, the people being killed and um, trying to get the casino built. So these people are dying. And the, the, I read the, the summary, and it said that there's a monster involved that's a toy statue one minute and an iron demon the next. Right. That's where it comes in. It looks like a little toy statuette. And when it's realized there's a tattoo in the area where these beams of light come out of his eyes, it locks on the tattoo, which makes the statuette grow bigger, and it makes the tattoos on the bodies come alive. And whatever tattoos on the body... That's actually what kills the person. What inspired this story? Here, you want him to tell you? So I'm talking to you now, Don. I always wanted to see a tattoo of myself on my body about a snake. I was thinking about that. And a, and a co-worker came walking by. And she got a brand new tattoo. And the way she showed me her arm, and the way her arm moved, I looked like the tattoo come alive on her. And that's what gave me the idea about writing a book about tattoos coming alive, killing people. And I also was thinking, everywhere you go, we got tattoos. And also, I was thinking about my dad. He made this on when my dad was in a foundry when he was about 19 years old. And he, and he, he made two aunt dolls. And I kept one of them. And I always had an idea about that aunt doll. I wanted, that aunt doll my dad made, I wanted to do something with that aunt doll. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But uh, through the years growing up, I wanted to make a, as, I was going to do something about that aunt doll. I was Go to the foundry, have a bunch of them made, have a bunch of them, and try to sell them. Tattoo, so I'm not the only dollar to do a tattoo. I was going to call it the, the book Arn Man, but a movie came out when I was writing a book. I, had, I was writing down Arn Man. And then people said, you know, Don, you can't use Arn Man no more because a movie came out with an Arn Man, so that canceled that Arn Man out. And my, my fiance, it wasn't for her helping me, the book would never got done. She did all the Organized it for me. I couldn't organize it. I had a lot kind of spelling words. I didn't go to high school. And I, and I, I was going all over town. I was going to different cafes, different restaurants. I walk in the door and I say, hey, I spell this word. I spell that word. People would stop helping me spell words. I think it took eight years to write this book. I took my time and I finally got it done and, and it came out really, really great. I think I couldn't be any more proud of it. Good for you. Thank you. When I started this book, there was no consider being built. And Dodge did it all. And about two years into the book, people came in and said, you know what? They're building a casino in Dodge. I said, no, there's no way. They said, yeah, they're building a casino. And that's kind of spooky to me and Patty. So you were writing about this casino being built in Dodge, and the next thing you know, a casino's yeah. really being built in Dodge. Yeah, like two years later. Wow. And into the book. You know, that, that was kind of spooky to uh, me and Cupcake. The first couple of pictures you read is funny. About a bathroom scene. I don't want to go into that, but it, it's funny. Okay. And, and I want to say, the people that bought my book so far, I want to thank them. And the ones that doesn't buy I want to thank them very much for buying the book. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right. Don and Patty, thanks so much. Finally, Barry Parker is a librarian at California Baptist University. He is all about character development. In his book, Phantom Revelation, we meet several characters in the midst of chaos, going through personal crisis. And yet, somehow, they're all linked. Explain, Barry. I, I guess the thing is, it, it's about self-discovery and just sort of working through chaos, which which is kind of exaggerated in this book, and, and getting a sense that that even with that, there is a flow to the universe. And, you know, the, the pieces are in place as crazy as things might look. The pieces are in place? You mean we're destined? You know, people here are trying to figure everything out, and, and nothing seems to make sense. And um, ultimately, it's just a matter of trying to... Um, to see where things land in the end. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it's a satisfactory ending for people when they get there, or, or maybe it's a very satisfactory ending just in terms of uh, where these people you know, settle after going through all these uh, you know, personal crises. So like a six degrees of separation kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Their interaction is a little bit, you know, I, I have to have a villain, and, and uh, everything kind of connects through, uh, you know, through this villain and, uh, and, and through the protagonist of the story. Well, you know, it says on your 
On your summary, phantom revelation pushes the limits, blurring distinctions between love, obsession, sanity, and insanity, physical and spiritual reality. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So you've been writing for years. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, I enjoy writing. I think I write well, and I, I try to make a point of making every sentence count. I, was just, I have a Ph.D. in biblical studies, so I've, I've written all of your stuff in that field, too. So. so this is your first step with Paige. How did that work out for you? I think it was it was pretty good. I think the process uh, worked well. You know, the editing process they kept in touch with me um, pretty well. And I guess the important thing now is, is just getting uh, word out there and getting the book out there, which is which is probably the hardest thing of all. I think. Well, are you you're in a library? There's plenty of readers there. You think you can get your book in your library? Oh, I've already got it there. I got it there right away. <laughs> are you doing book signings or anything like that? Um, well, actually, I did do one. Um, I, there's, there's a, a lot of different groups around that, uh, that do have book book signings, uh, of local authors especially. I, I'll probably uh, yeah, get in touch with these people again. I, I did that with my first book. You know, I, I just want people to read it. I mean, I don't have to become rich or famous from it, but I'd, I'd like people to read it. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I, I want them just to think a little bit outside the box, um, stretch their minds. You know, like, you know, as you mentioned, you know, I'm trying to push limits. Uh, I want them to understand... You know, some of the uh, you know important aspects of life, uh, you know, um, and just get a different way of looking at things. Just sort of give themselves more possibilities. I think I think people just need possibilities in their thinking, and ultimately they need to be be comforted too. In, in the sense that, as I said initially, there is a flow to the universe that, that things that things are the way they are for a reason, and you know, we just sort of need to be in touch with that, uh, you know, no matter how crazy things are for us. Good enough, Barry, and we all know how crazy things can get. Everything happens for a reason. Everything. And you, you know what that means. That means that there's a reason you're listening to the Page Publishing Book Club right now. That's right. And, Rob, there's a reason you're here and I'm here. That's right. And there's a reason Rob and I got to get out of here. Time is running out on this week's edition of the PPBC, but we will be back. We will be back. We always come back next week. Same time, same place, same station, 710 WOR. Have a great weekend.